The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is other than 24 tonight. As a nation, we are in the cusp of another election. Be it the presidential or a general, once again, citizens of the country will get an opportunity to select the path this nation should lead to. Will we be embracing the similar sentiments of security, economy and development? Or will the nation be looking at modern issues that are ravaging the world, like climate change, migration and brain drain? The two-party system in the country has only brought a mediocre level of growth to the nation in the past 70 years since independence where one party wants the country to be self-sufficient and the other to be more liberal. Will this ideology clash once again on the election platform? Or will the voters take the issues to their hand as seen many times in changing the political sentiments? Tonight, my panel to discuss the way forward is Dr. Charitha Herath, who is the senior lecturer at the University of Peradeniya and the former secretary to the Ministry of Mass Media. And Dr. Pakya Soti Sarvanamuttu, who is the founding executive director at the Center for Policy Alternatives and a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Group. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. Good evening everyone and welcome to the program. I'm Mahesh Johnny. Tonight, our discussion focuses on the policies that would shape our country in the upcoming elections. Well, in my opening statement this evening, once again we find ourselves at the crossroads. It's an election here, hopefully. And we as citizens of this country once again grappled with the question, are we taking a stand or are we blindly following? The election that's supposed to take place is a presidential election. Due to the 19th Amendment being played, President Maitri Policy Rusena's first term is coming to an end after five years in power. In 2015, remember those buzzwords that resonated all across the nation? Remember the word Maitri Palane or good governance or even the 100-day revolution? That was five years ago and here we are taking stock of things. One thing is very clear, those buzzwords which was very good to listen to has failed us five years down the line. The promised economic renaissance has now become somewhat of a dud and more so we've even failed at securing our nation. Yes, there were some achievements as well. So here we are once again hopefully given the power to choose. I'm sure you would have heard time and time after to choose wisely which would ensure the country's future in prosper, is prosperous for everyone, like Bernie Sanders says, not just for the 1%. Thankfully, we do have options. We have the conservative option in the form of the SLPP and the SLFP, led by former President Mahindra Rajpaksa and current President Mahindra Palasi Dissena. And then there's the liberal UNP that's led by Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe. While we wait hopefully to see who the candidates of these respective parties are going to be and what their policies are, we as a nation need to decide whether are we going to continuously follow blindly or whether are we taking a stand and telling our leaders what the issues really are and what solutions we are seeking. What would be your decisive factor in selecting a candidate for the upcoming elections? Um, I think we had too many people who care about themselves more than the country. So I'd uh, love to see a person, young person from our generation come up and uh, who actually would do something for the country instead of doing it for themselves. I think that's what we need in uh, the upcoming election. Someone young, yeah. When the previous government is done the corruptions, this uh, they say uh, this is Yahapalne. But you can see there is no Yahapalne anymore good governance there is we, we can't see so we won't change but real change not like that last time we uh, does that uh, 2015 we need actually change since uh, the Easter Sunday attacks security would be a prime concern because that directly links to the economy as well because we also very tourism based econ uh, that tourism plays a huge role in our economy so because of that security is a prime concern and of course development and forward thinking so I think a leader who is less corrupt, 
even though it's very um, not most politicians are. Um, but yeah, less corrupt person who is for democracy and will push that. And also no favoritism, you know. You'll put the people who are correct for the jobs in the right places or maybe employ professionals to actually figure out solutions and to incorporate them into the policies. Number one, the, 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 the country. We, are, we need someone who is really concerned about the country. You know, the, without the country, there is no election, no people, no one, nothing. Nothing we can do without. First, we should have the, our country. We safeguard our country. So we should have a person who is concerned about the country first. So this is the type of person that we expect. We in the, I expect. I seen in Sri Lanka, this politic is a business, right? It's whatever. These people don't care that anything. They care only the money. Politicians should be educated people and uh, they have to understand whatever because uh, not, uh, not only the education, actually they have to think of the country and the nation. Actually we should have one leader. Actually the now situation we have so many leaders. The leader should be a, should be a one leader. Oh, I think uh, national security is the most considered factor when it comes to the uh, deciding factor when uh, selecting the president. Uh, economic and uh, securities. Uh, in the country. Uh, the last 70 odd years, no political party has done anything to this country. They have taken the maximum out of our country, our people, and not given anything to the country. So, the, the last government or the present government has done nothing, right? So, we need uh, people with a lot of integrity. Uh, we don't need 225 people to rule this country. It's a, it's a matter of about 50 to 60 people enough. This is my uh, view only. And I wish a uh, safe Sri Lanka. You should have some kind of a policy. So integrity depends on the policy. Let's get more perspective on that subject. Uh, joining me now are uh, heavyweights, if I may say, in the policy-making decisions. Uh, I ha today have with me Dr. Charitha Herat. He's the senior lecturer at the University of Peradeniya. And he was also the former uh, secretary to the media ministry. Welcome, sir. And also, uh, on the other hand, is um, Dr. Paki Soti Saravanamuttu. He is the di executive director of uh, the Center for Policy Alternatives here in Colombo um, and has been very uh, participating in terms of policy decisions with this government as well. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this program. Um, if I may start with you, uh, Dr. Paki Soti. Um, like I said, you were very instrumental in getting the 2015 uh, government's agenda. Uh, you've been contributing towards it. Now, five, almost five years down the line, are you happy with what they've done so far? Well, yes, I'm happy with what they've done so far. What I'm very unhappy with is their inability or their unwillingness to communicate this to the country at large. I'm happy with the 19th Amendment. I'm happy with the RTI legislation, to name two things to begin with. Each one of those has important consequences for government, for the direction of governance in this country, but it hasn't been communicated sufficiently. Or take, for example, the mechanisms on transitional justice. They have far-reaching consequences. But people don't know enough about them. The space has been vacated for those to distort to spin what these things are about and so therefore the other side is leading the debate so what you're saying is they've done it but they did not say it well they've done some things i'm not saying that they've done everything they've done some things they haven't talked about them propagated what the consequences of those things are and they haven't explained as to why they haven't done what they haven't done. But that is not exactly the same sentiments uh, with the public if you go and speak to anyone and ask them um, about the Yaha Palani or the good governance. Yeah, as far as the general public are concerned, Yaha Palani is a thing of the past. It has been totally discredited by this government and that's a great shame because there are things that they can point to, there are things that they can take credit for, but 
they've missed the bus, as it were, as far as that's concerned. I don't know whether an election campaign will galvanise them to get in on the act, but they haven't paid sufficient attention, and they haven't. You see, the thing is this, you know, if you are talking about a reform agenda, the only way you're going to fulfil it is if you carry the people along with you. And that's what this government has failed to do. If I turn to you, Dr. Uh, Herod, um, what is your take on this? Has this government been able to fulfill every single thing that uh, they, not every single thing, but at least like 80% of what they said when they came to power in 2015? Well, I don't think so. Actually, the main argument that this government or the group of people who were helping this government to come to power were raising was mainly the democracy and the democratic space to be developed. I think uh, even beyond the economic and uh, development kind of reasoning, the people who against who went against the previous regime was arguing for bigger democracy and better democracy and enhanced form of democracy of the country. But what I think and what uh, people could see today uh, has a huge uh, issue on that particular matter. Now, for example, uh, as we all know that the one uh, way of uh, looking at democracy is uh, allowing people to decide on governing. Now, democratic system is defined as a system uh, that uh, governed by discussions, governed by decisions of the people. But this government has continuously tried to uh, postpone all the elections which came after 2015. Like they had to go for the general election in 2015, August. After that, even one and a half years were late for the uh, elections of uh, local governments. Then that government, that, that election, that, that the results of that election was shown that the government decision was not taken by the people. Then they have started to force on the next part of the elections, which was called uh, provincial councils. Now, uh, out of nine provinces, eight were completely dissolved by naturally, but the government has put a technical reasoning that we can't go for election. That is true. We all agree that once you have uh, changed half of the uh, act, which is uh, for the elections of the provincial council, you can't have elections, as the uh, chairman of the election commission said. But now, this 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 particular point itself shows that the intentions of the government, though my friend, my learned friend uh, Sarah said that there was some development, I also would agree uh, with regard to this uh, RTI Act. Actually, the act which we were uh, supposed to uh, bring in and we were supposed to implement, initiate, which was not happened when we were in government. And I was, uh, uh, even that time we had a, uh, internal discussions mm -hmm. on this thing. But I am really happy that this government uh, brought that piece of legislation into actions, uh, which even needs more regulations to be done to develop it uh, further and to get a complete uh, benefit for the people. I agree with that thing, but uh, out of, uh, beyond that part, even 19 Amendment has a completely uh, uh, different uh, thing that we just need to look at. And uh, there are some good intentions behind that, but the implementations and the uh, technicality mm. was uh, not that much uh, helpful for the country. If I turn to you, uh, Dr. Pakistati, now um, successive governments, successive elections which we've taken, uh, which have taken place since, let's say, 2000, um, has been on platforms of promises. We will do this for that, give us the power. Then people do listen to it and they do give the power. But then it not, does not happen according to the way that they promised. So ultimately people are getting duped every single election. So they are not getting it. Uh, we are hopefully at the, uh, in the cusp of another election. It could be presidential, it could be general, whatever it is. Um, in your point of view, what are the areas people should be focusing on in when we are going for this new election, whether it's presidential or general? What could be the ultimate thing that they should be looking towards? You know, apart from the sort of policy and programming, the one thing that we need to come to grips with in this country is what kind of Sri Lanka do we want in the 21st century? 
we have dabbled with this notion of unity in diversity, mm -hmm. that we are made up of many peoples who have certain characteristics which need to be preserved and protected and it invariably has been things like family laws and we have this debate now about the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act and all of that. Then we have that sort of notion of a kind of civic nationalism. This notion that, look, everyone, irrespective of ethnicity and religion, are all equal before the law, coming from the French Revolution. Now, we need to have this debate and discussion in terms of which one are we choosing? Can we mold the two? We need that sort of strategic vision because I, for one, will say, yes, unity in diversity. However, that diversity has to be tempered and conditioned by the fundamental rights chapter of the constitution of the country. Mm -hmm. No one should be excluded from the constitution of the country. You know, and that debate, we're having this debate now, I think there's a backlash now against the government's proposals to amend the Muslim uh, Marriages and Divorce Act. That we need because that's going to give us the framework. I mean, today we are talking about... I say you need the Muslim Divorce Act? Or? No, no, we need to have this debate oh. to give us this overall framework because now we've had single Tamil ethnic conflict. Then we have singular Buddhist, singular Buddhist and Muslim ethnic conflict, singular Buddhist and Christian, evangelical Christians, all communities are having conflicts with each other. How do you resolve them? You have to come out and give that leadership in order to provide for every single kid and, and this needs to permeate the education system, all of that. I mean, we stratify people from the point at which they go to school. Do singular and Tamil children go to school with each other? No, they don't. You know, so we have to have that real root and branch debate about what we want to be. Are we, for example, you know, we're building, we're reclaiming land from the sea and talking about an international financial city. Who are going to, who are the people who go through the Sri Lankan education system who are going to get jobs there? Mm -hmm. You know, how are they going to get jobs there if they're learning in Singhala and Tamil? You know, there are lots of questions that we need to answer if we get that one right, of what kind of Sri Lanka we want in the 21st century. Do you think, taken the current political club, if I may say, the people who are there, whether it's the opposition or the government, is there anyone who you think who could bring that kind of visionary thinking? Well, unfortunately, I don't see anyone who has come out with it. There are some people who are seen as being largely majoritarian. Mm -hmm. There are others who are being seen as pandering to minorities in order to win elections. And so in between, there is that middle position where you need to carve out your philosophy of where this country should go. And I hope that as we approach an election, that will become an issue. You know, we can talk about development, we can talk about democracy, all of those things will fall in under that general debate of what kind of country we want to be. Dr. Herath, what is your take on this? What should the voter be considering when they go in for this next election? Is it the, the same usual thing, development, security, or do we need to be looking at something else like uh, what well, Dr. Yeah. said? Actually, I think there are three things that uh, people would uh, look at and think about when they are going to participate to, uh, participate to this uh, upcoming, mainly the uh, presidential election. One is the uh, to to look at to, to develop a strong Sri Lanka. A strong, a strong uh, means that you just need to have uh, protections and uh, right protections and uh, also kind of uh, uh, strong uh, positions within the global uh, uh, discussions. So that is one thing that uh, especially the educated uh, group of people are looking for, how to get the country strong in the global market and global settings. Number two is the democratic uh, positioning within the countries, mainly to develop and protect uh, democratic uh, values and institutions, the frameworks that uh, 
we have laid and we have developed the last uh, 70 odd years after independence. And uh, including uh, the um, way of governing and way of selecting, electing people's um, elections as well. And thirdly, how to get a uh, wealthy uh, position for the country, uh, economically sounded wealthy positions. These three things are, are uh, coming as a uh, different packages of one main uh, set. Uh, so I think uh, these are the main areas that uh, the uh, parties uh, should look at when they are forming their policies. Strong positions of the country, of the global settings, and the democratic uh, protections of the democratic values and institutions, and uh, the uh, economic developments for the country. If I may ask, uh, that is from the part of the political parties when they are bringing up their manifestos and their election promises. What should a voter, let's say the, the Generation Z or, or the ones who are actually coming the youth vo vote block, <coughs> what should they be looking at? Because all these big words is not resonating with them. But, but words like free Wi-Fi or, or, or you know, uh, gym equipment is, is kind of resonating. So wh how can the younger crowd or, or the voter, what are the things they should be looking I, at? I think even I have asked this question from my students who are uh, coming to my classes at university. Actually, they, they don't care about the parties and they don't care about leaders and, and things like that. They think that... Uh, what they want is to uh, go to a good uh, kind of uh, environment where they could be able to get good jobs. And they also wanted to have a uh, kind of free uh, society where they could entertain what they are uh, looking at from the global uh, platforms. Exactly. So I think uh, the economic development and freedom are two different but important things that uh, the younger generations uh, is uh, looking for and uh, actually that was the kind of uh, dream that they had then when they have many of them have voted for even this uh, incumbent government current government in 2015 actually uh, i think uh, uh, that uh, dream was not uh, you know, yeah, materialize, and that was a dream yeah, then, and today it was a, it is a dream. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, if I uh, ask from you, Dr. Pakistati, um in terms of the economy, um, we were promised a lot of things in 2015. We're going to have this economic renaissance, um, lots of jobs, lots of foreign investment. Uh, it's not the case right now, and on top of it, we have the April 21st uh, uh, attack. And now, um, but we have the recipe to become a very developed nation. We have the resources, we have, have all that in the country. So whatever the um, political party may be, what type of a economic policy do you think should they be thinking of when we're going into the future? Look, we have the economic potential to be extremely prosperous and be a hub and all of those things. But we aren't. Why? We have 1.5 million public servants, some of whom are doing absolutely nothing. It probably is more economic to pay them to stay at home. We are an aging population, which means that in 30 years' time, we won't have a demographic dividend. Yeah? We already have, I think two years ago or three, the government conceded that there were 25,000 illegal migrant laborers in this country and some of them are working in paddy fields. They're from the rest of South Asia. If the government concedes 25,000, double it. So we have another problem there in terms of no farmers' children want to be farmers. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Right? Then, we are talking about reclaiming land from the sea. Who is the kid who is going to go through a Sri Lankan educational system and get a job other than as an office assistant in the international financial city. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Those days they used to come to golfers to look at the sea, now they'll come to look at another country. Mm. This is a recipe for disaster. We have to take root and branch reform. And 
in order to do that in a functioning democracy, you have to carry the people along with you. You can't do elections by saying, look, when we come to power, we're going to give 10,000 rupees more to every public servant, and we're going to add another 10,000 to the public service roster. It doesn't make sense, you know. So we have to come to some kind of economic consensus. You know, for years and years and years, since 1977, we had a rough consensus in this country that the executive presidency should be abolished. Do we have a consensus with regard to any aspect of the economy? We should go for that, you know. We have, now because there's more freedom than there was before, we have strikes every other day. What are they striking about? What is their vision of the future? You know, so we have to come up with a policy that addresses the real problems that we have. And only then can we proceed. And it is root and branch. We have to start with the education system as well. I mean, these are long-term things. Look, English is the international language in the world. What is the situation with regard to the teaching of English in Sri Lanka? It's pathetic. You know, so there are tough decisions that have to be made. There is the other argument, uh, like countries when you go to Germany, uh, Japan or, or Western nations, they celebrate their own language and ensure that English not, is not that kind of That's important. That's nonsense. Today you go to Germany or to Japan. In Japan, on the streets of Japan, in the undergrounds in Japan, you have train stations, etc., marked in, in Japanese and in English. And in Germany, in France, anywhere in Europe, they talk to you in English. 25 years ago, that may not have been the case. But, I mean, look, 1.5 billion or whatever Chinese are learning English. Indeed. Well, that's a very good point to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back right here on Get Real. Stay with us. to get real. We are here with Dr. Charita Heratha and Dr. Paki Soti Saramuthu discussing about what kind of policies or strategies the voter should be looking at when we go for whether it's a general election or a presidential election. And there was one good point uh, Dr. Paki Soti touched and I want to get a response from you um, Dr. Herath, uh, is the education system. He said uh, that apparently no one would be eligible enough to get a job in the new financial city. Um, it seems like our educational system is just teaching some kind of subjects and then hoping for the best uh, yeah. for, for the students. Yeah, actually, it is, it is very important uh, issue that uh, Sarah brought in. And uh, in, in Sri Lankan situation today is uh, kind of pathetic in, with regard to education. Even uh, from the previous regime and this regime both, uh, actually have to look at uh, the, the same issue in different uh, ways. Like now, uh, we, uh, there are three sections within the education which are very important. Number one is uh, curriculum, curriculum development. In the developed countries, the, this has been taken as a very important subject and there are specialist and university courses to uh, follow for developing curriculums. This is a science. And in this, this is the only country which I see that, you know, this was completely neglected and just collecting some university professors who don't have some time works and get into kind of, you know, the uh, bodies to develop these curriculums. And some curriculums were not uh, uh, those are not up to date and those were completely sometimes useless contents. Number two, teacher training is another science which is very important sections of uh, education. Now in Sri Lanka we just uh, take uh, teachers from university uh, guys, university passed out batches and uh, they were not trained at all sometime throughout their life. They were just, you know, paid salaries and they were just teaching different kind of subjects, but they don't know how to teach at all. 
So then the teacher's training is a second section which was completely neglected and you know uh, not taken into consideration. Then the third thing which has been taken very seriously by all the regimes that was the infrastructure developments. You build uh, you know uh, halls, libraries and things like that. But you know even the government of Sri Lanka or the main guys who are doing these things actually don't know what is the sample of real classroom. Now if you look at uh, some developed countries, the classroom is a very scientifically developed uh, entity like a place. Like in Sri Lanka it was also a neglected thing. Though we have spent a lot of money on uh, this infrastructure developments under dif different kind of regimes. We had a different uh, programs, Navodhya Parcel, Pokuru Parcel, mm -hmm. Langama Parcel, Hondama oh. Parcel. There are different kind of names under different ministers. But you know, production was not taken seriously and the produced guys were not uh, uh, productive at all sometime to the market. So that is one area which we just need to look at very carefully, whoever comes to power in this uh, upcoming elections. I think this is one section that should be uh, looked at very seriously. Well, if I may shift gears uh, and turn to you, Dr. Pakisoti, um, human rights, 2015. Human rights was a massive subject. President Mahinda Rajapaksa was painted in the red um, with regard to that subject. We are passing the April 21st attacks and now again we are looking at another election. How do you think human rights is going to play in these elections? Well, I think the issue of human rights, which was very much the whole question of the transitional justice and the reconciliation mechanisms, Mangala Samarira as foreign minister went to Geneva and promised what? Missing persons, reparations, truth and justice commission and the accountability mechanism. Now we've got first the first two. We are waiting for commission of truth and justice and with regard to the accountability mechanism, I suppose we'll never get it because of the agreement that there should be uh, international judges which the government agreed to and now is saying look no way it's an infringement on our sovereignty so that issue has somewhat gone stale and so now people are looking at pursuing universal jurisdiction and questions like that but there are continuing human rights issues with regard to the use of torture all of those questions which persist and you know if we are going to pursue a focused policy of economic development, we really need to weave into that respect to fundamental rights and freedoms and human rights because we have been used to the notion of human rights. We've had a functioning democracy for over 70 years, etc. And people are not going to take it lying down. You know, so in that respect, human rights is always going to be an issue. The level of intensity with which it is felt will vary. Uh, if you take the issue of human rights, right now mostly uh, the people who are actually making a, a, a noise of that particular issue is from the north. Hmm. You don't see the people from the south joining hands and saying... Well, you're looking at a particular type of human rights with regard to accountability. Yeah. but. Presumably the demonstrations that you get every other day are also about human rights. The whole question of whether education is a human right, all of those questions do come into it. But yes, as far as the North is concerned, remember in 2015, accountability was the buzzword. Okay. In the South, south of Vaunia, it was accountability for the greed, the larceny, the stealing, and all of that that was supposed to have happened in the South by the government. North of Vaunia, it was accountability with regard to human rights violations, crimes against humanity and all of that. And we have, they have got nothing as far as that's concerned. They've got the two mechanisms that have been set up, but at the same time, again, I go back to the whole question of communication. An office of missing persons needs technical experience, forensic experience, all of that which is going to take time to set up. It's not going to be able to produce these things overhand. I was made secretary of the consultation task force on reconciliation mm -hmm. mechanisms. The first thing we said to the government was, why don't you go and tell the people what do you mean by transitional justice? Why are you talking about it? We even wrote a speech for the president. It wasn't delivered. 
you know, so you need to take human rights if it is going to succeed. You have to take it and champion it and put it out in the forefront. Even from the lessons learned in Reconciliation Commission of the Rajapaksa regime, you know, the news broadcasts every day. They should have put this as the first piece of news so that people in the North and in the South would have recognized that reconciliation is of pivotal importance for the future of the country. Indeed, uh, Dr. Herat, uh, one of the uh, areas that Dr. Pakistati touched was the fact that, yes, the buzzword was accountability, and along with that, there was another word called um, curbing corruption. Um, what do you think about the success of that? Well, yes, but let me, let me let me let me add a little bit uh, what uh, Sarah said on this human right thing. Now, actually, uh, there's a one one main mistakes that I think uh, some of the Colombo-based civil society um, personalities were bringing in uh, with regard to uh, human right issue in this country. Actually, we all have to agree that there are some universal universal agreements and universal stands on, on this uh, human right thing. But as the same way, we just need to look at the contextual grounds of the given situations and country. I think uh, the liberal argument on human rights and reconciliation was not uh, successfully achieved in this uh, country due to that cultural reasons. I think we just need to look at how could we uh, engage after whatever the 30 years war in this country and what, what are the kind of tools that we just need to look at, not from the textbook liberal peace processes or not from the uh, kind of technicality of UN systems, but yeah, from from one, for uh, us. one from the ground actually. That is one thing that we just need to look at. I'm not saying that we don't need human rights or we don't need the universal kind of agreements. We need to know, we need to have. That is true, but at the same time to have a kind of productive engagement in this sector, you just need to look at the cultural and contextual readings of this whole thing than just the global kind of interpretation, number one. Number two, uh, that is true that this uh, uh, corruption issue has been a big issue of this country from last 70 odd years. And, uh, and also meritocracy, like lack of meritocracy in, in many different sections, uh, including uh, members, uh, the position of the members of parliament. So like uh, we just need to look at how we could develop a merit-based society and lack of uh, corruptions. These two areas are still areas to be engaged from whatever the government that is going to come. Uh, in one of the dailies you wrote an article uh, which says next president a talker or a doer. Um, what did you mean by that? What exactly? Actually, it was it was kind of like in Singhal, it was very interesting thing that in 2015, uh, I think uh, uh, the main argument became from uh, political reasoning than the economic reasonings. Like in Marxist uh, uh, theory, we have two reasonings. One is the economic reasonings, which Marxists argue that that is the um, ground. And uh, they thought that that was the turning ground of uh, whatever the society, human society. And this political thing is a kind of hegemonic, kind of conceptual line, where you have a dream or religious kind of thing. But my reading on 2015 regime change was that it was, uh, you know, motivated from that political ending than the economic and ground level thing. Uh, in economically, the country was in a good shape at that time and uh, development uh, activities were also very productive at, at, uh, given, given to that particular time. But uh, the political reasoning uh, was the one section that was taken by the uh, group of people uh, to to change that uh, regime. So I was that I was just arguing that you know Toker was the uh, guy who got the mandate than the doer at in 2015. And my point uh, now is that we just need to have a doer and Toker together, the guy or the group. Indeed, uh, with that I think uh, let's take a short commission break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone, to Get Real. We are here with Dr. Charita Herath and also Dr. Pakisoti Sarvanmuthu. Dr. Sarvanmuthu, if I turn to you, um, ask you about the 19th Amendment. President who fought for it is now saying it's, it's a mess. What is your take on it? He actually even uh, pointed the finger at you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, the 19th Amendment at the end of the day, I see it as a kind of transitional provision. Now, I see it as a transitional provision away from the executive presidency towards parliament and prime ministerial government. I think the president, on the other hand, sees it as a movement backwards, somewhat regressive in my opinion, towards the 1978 type of presidency. You know, the 19th Amendment in that respect, you know, has to be protected and it cannot, we can't turn our backs on it because if we do that, we go back to what we have, have what we had in 1978, a strong centralized government which oversaw an insurgency in the South, 30 years of civil war. And now we are seeing conflict between the various communities in the country. So, I mean, I think the arguments that have been made with regard to the executive presidency are totally fallacious. They've never held for me. I don't think they're ever going to hold. So we need to progress beyond the 19th Amendment. The government in 2015 said it was going to bring in reforms that would not attract a referendum. Now we have to push them, if they are going to be the next government, we have to push them to continue and complete that reform exercise. Indeed, uh, if, you're, uh, if I get your take, uh, Dr. Herath, uh, in terms of the 19th Amendment, uh, the President says it's not exactly good for the country. Actually, the 19th Amendment was a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, uh, intermediate thing, as uh, he said. But uh, even at that time, the government or the group that I have helped, the party I have helped were uh, supportive of this uh, piece of legislation. But it seems uh, due to the time and due to the kind of uh, uh, urgency of the matter and the documentation and technicality were not uh, per perfectly done in this uh, piece of legislation. And uh, there were a lot of loopholes at the moment that we can see. I like think if like now like uh, if we have presidency with the mandate from the people, then uh, that president, whoever he may be, uh, actually has to deal with some issues and has to give some promises to the people. Then now, after 19th Amendment, you can't deliver any sort of promises what you have given to people in development base or otherwise. So I think that is one thing that we just need to look at. If we are going to retain this piece of legislation, uh, the uh, presidency uh, elected from the people would be a one main issue that we just need to look at. Number two, uh, the culturally, uh, whether we are, um, we are mature enough to take this prime ministerial kind of government is another thing that we just need to look at. We have to, we are not supposed to forget that until 1978 or 77, it was a kind of a prime ministerial driven uh, centralized government, uh, which was parliamentary system. But it was uh, fail uh, as we have seen that the presidential system in, in after, after 1978. So uh, it was not due to the system, it was due to different other reasons that we failed. I think uh, if we, I'm even, even in this prior presidential systems, there were some, uh, there were some positive uh, uh, signs, positive uh, points that we could look at from the history when there was the next time. I think uh, what we need to do is to take a clear position whether we are going to have uh, the presidential system which elected from the people, uh, then you just need to arrange accordingly. If not, you have to leave it completely out. Uh, for that, you have to get a mandate from the people from, I mean, through a kind of referendum, which could be done. Then you have to do that kind of 
complete changing from the positions of 1978 constitution to a new one. But in between would make a completely a mess, which uh, I don't know what uh, President it's, mentioned. It's exactly where we are right now. This is, this is a real ex example for that. So, uh, Dr. Parkinson, you, you advocate to getting rid of the executive? And executive presidency, yes. And, and your reason behind is? Is that the executive presidency consolidates power in one office, and as a consequence, you can't do very much in terms of a for a start devolution and better governance, because everything is in the hands of one particular individual. And I don't think that is good for democracy at all. We need to move towards a parliamentary system where we can develop more checks and balances, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, prime ministerial government with PR. What we had before was first past the post and you had a two-thirds majority in 1970 and a five-sixth majority in 1977. That we can't allow. Uh, if I may shift gears, I don't know whether you gentlemen have been uh, watching the U.S. presidential debates of the Democratic Party, um, the candidates were debating even uh, in two days, and uh, the main things that they talk about, just, uh, talking about global threats, is climate change, hmm. Russia, and also nuclear threats. Now, this is on a global level. So, uh, if I ask from you, um, Dr. Pakisothi, um, if you take new uh, climate change, we are a country that is getting battered by climate change. And yet we do not see our politicians or our leaders at least remotely talking about it or, or taking any kind of stand on it. It's just when it rains, uh, it floods, okay, we will give some kind of this thing and that kind of uh, attitude. So going forward, what kind of policies do you, should we be thinking about this? Of course we should be thinking about it. I mean, how many ministers have banned plastic bags? Yes. Or the silly, silly bag, or whatever you call it. How many ministers have done that? But they're still being used. Now, why? Is it because there is some sort of corruption behind it? Is it because of governmental inefficiency? So we need to tackle those things. If we tackle those things, the others will fall into line. The subject area of climate change and environment, I don't think you need a technical solution per se to that. One needs to look at that governance framework and clean it up at that level. The rest will follow. Dr. Herat, uh, this president is an environmentally friendly president. That's how he pictures himself. Yet we do not see clear-cut policies on climate change and things that is adversely affecting communities in this country. So going forward, what is your take on that? Well, actually, it is a very important issue. And I, when I was uh, chairman of the Central Environmental Authority, I was actually dealing with some of these issues uh, very seriously. In my uh, opinion, Sri Lankan's uh, intervention to this discuss discussion was uh, productive, good, uh, due to I mean, if relative to some other countries of the region. Uh, but there are some uh, lacunas and lapses even at the moment. Uh, one, actually, with regard to environment, there are different kind of uh, uh, areas that we just need to look at. Many of the issues are uh, societally driven and solutions are technically driven and decisions are politically driven. So then you can't get uh, all these three sections together. Right. Yeah, like, you know, the responses are coming from the people and uh, answers are developing or should be developed in the uh, kind of, you know, technical um, uh, areas and uh, the decision should be taken by the politicians. So then sometimes things are getting mess. Uh, but uh, still, uh, but the second thing, as you said, that global engagement to Sri Lankan uh, politics uh, has now come from a different end. Now the regional, Indo-Pacific regional political uh, engagements are very serious things that we just need to look at. I think uh, due to the reasons of the mismanagement of the region by this uh, current government, uh, now Chinese, Indians and Americans, interventions and interest uh, now were completely focused on this region. Uh, even the American uh, State Department has started Indo-Pacific uh, Special Desk yes. in almost all the embassies of the region. So uh, we, the government of Sri Lanka, now 
we are dealing with three uh, countries uh, by using three different parts of our sh our, uh, uh, our our uh, what is that called uh, this our, our foreign policies now like in Japanese Indians and Chinese intervention to this section uh, is very important to be look at like I mean I think this this government uh, did not take those areas very seriously and they were just thinking about how to make some foreign currency by using you know whatever the capacity that they have then uh, this uh, uh, all this uh, regional issue became uh, completely a problematic uh, area that to be engaged in future government. Uh, indeed um very quickly, Dr. Pakistati, uh, if I may ask from you, um, today the uh, State Defense Minister said that we need the support of uh, international countries, mainly the United States, where there are FBI agents in, in, in this country who he says came to help the uh, fight against global terrorism. Is this the means of bringing in foreign troops to our country, or do you think what exactly do you think the thinking behind? Of course, the preferable situation would be where we deal with our security problems on our own. But we've always had, and every country has, the whole question of, look, there might be foreign expertise that you require. But in order to be able to regulate that and manage that, you need strong government and you need a very clear policy as to where you think you're going and what you're doing at the present moment. So. Is it the beginning of uh, foreign interference in this country? <laughs> it could be. It could be if it's mismanaged. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pakisuti uh, Saran Muthu, the founding executive director at the Center for Policy Alternatives, and Dr. Charita Herath, the senior lecturer at the University of Peradeni, and also the former secretary to the uh, Ministry of Mass Media. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the program. That's all the time we have for this discussion. I'll be back on the other side with the closing argument statements. Well, by this time, it's quite evident that the upcoming election, be it presidential or general, it's going to get very ugly very soon. We will, of course, have the front row seat to that ugliness, where candidates will continue to sling mud and prioritize that over policy or strategy. It's up to us to continuously educate ourselves and more so ask the questions from the people who are vying for the top job to ascertain as to what their beliefs and ideologies are for the future of this nation. Remember, most of us felt that we were let down in 2015. That is the sentiment that's mostly out there. Whether you look on social media or speak to anyone, you have this resounding anger that the leaders who came to change failed to change themselves. If you have been actively looking at politics in the past 10 years, one thing is very much clear, that we as a nation continue to go around and round in circles, listening to the same deafening agendas of the people who seek the mandate to govern. And every single time, after about a year or so, when, they, when the leaders act like politicians, we blame everyone because they failed. I think there's one more place to look at, in perhaps to lay the blame. That's ourselves. It was us who let them win, and it was us who allowed them to fail. Perhaps this election we can all gather together to demand quality of life over castles in the skies and hold the very people who asked for power accountable. To do that, we all must vote. I would like to leave you with a quote from the first and to date the only female Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, who said, winning or losing of the election is less important than strengthening the country. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us here at Other Dharana and the Get Real team. Thank you for watching. Good night.